everybody. In this video, I'm going to review the new ZWO ASI 2600MC Pro Duo. And this is that camera that came out recently that has an auto guider sensor built in. So that means if you're like me and you've got a telescope with a little guide scope and auto guider attached, you theoretically no longer need these. Everything is going to go through your main scope and onto the camera itself. And I'll admit, when I first heard about this, I was a bit skeptical, especially because I normally shoot in narrowband. I'm like, how is an auto guider going to see through let's say f7.5 or f8 and an airband filter. And that's actually what we're going to be doing in today's test because I'm going to put this through its paces. What we'll be doing is attaching the 80 millimeter optic to the ASCAR V here and we'll also put on the extender which will give us a focal length around 600 millimeters and an aperture around f7.4 I think. We'll also attach an Optolong L enhanced filter to the back of the telescope so we're really not going to get much light through here at all and we'll see how the auto guider performs. Before we get to those tests though, I want to head over to ZWO's website and take a look at the price, the specs, and some of the differences between this camera and the ASI 2600 which I recently reviewed. Okay, we're here on ZWO's website, and the first thing I want to talk about is the price. The 2600 Duo retails for $2,000. That's $200 more than the ASI 2600, the original. So basically you're paying $200 for the auto guider sensor to be built into the camera. And if we look at the specs here, we can actually see that the 2600 Duo is using the new ASI 220mm Mini Auto Guider, which retails for $300 by itself. So already, theoretically, you're saving yourself $100. But we also factor in a guide scope that's at least another $100. So in a sense, you could say you're saving yourself some money by going with this camera. That's assuming, let's say this is your first dedicated Astro camera, and you haven't purchased an Auto Guider or Guide Scope yet. If you're like me though, and you already have an auto guider and guide scope, then you're basically paying $200 to get rid of that stuff so you don't have to take it with you out in the field or attach it to your telescope. And obviously you'd have to decide if that's worth the investment or not, assuming the auto guider actually works well, which we'll test later today. There are some minor differences though between the Duo and the original camera, so let's talk about that real quick. If we look at this chart here, we can see that the max FPS has increased drastically from 3.5 FPS to 15 FPS with the Duo. Again, for what I do though, that doesn't really matter because I'm only shooting one photo at a time and it's like one photo every five minutes, so I don't really care what the frame rate is. But if you ever plan on doing planetary or anything else, that might be worth the extra money. The full well capacity has also been increased and theoretically that should help to prevent your highlights from getting clipped, as I understand it. It also just gives you more room to work with. The DDR3 buffer has been doubled so that should help with the file transfer speeds and things of that nature. And I would say the most important difference here though is the adapter. The 2600 Pro has an M42 adapter which is fairly normal. That's going to screw right onto the back of your telescope most likely without any need for any additional adapters. However, the Duo camera has an M54 thread which is considerably larger. And that makes sense because now you have two sensors in there. Both of them need to get light so you need a larger opening. The problem is that M54 does not just screw onto the back of most telescopes and you're going to need a step down ring. This is something Nico covered in his video and he brought up a very valid point that the included ring is not very easy to use and it can get stuck which is a nightmare. And we'll see just how much of a problem it is in this video as well. If we scroll down we can see some information on the guide sensor. Again this is using the ASI 220mm Mini which is their newest camera sensor and that should be quite a bit better than the older 120 Mini which I've used for many years and really haven't had any problems with. The sensor size is the same between the 2600 and the 26 Duo. They're both 26 megapixels APS-C. Another thing to note is that the 2600 Duo has a back illuminated CMOS sensor, which improves sensitivity and noise reduction. It actually does quite a bit for astrophotography. I know a lot of the DSLR manufacturers have been trying to include this in some of their newer cameras to help with noise. Beyond that, there's really not much to talk about here. I did want to say though that the gain is something we should focus on because I've seen this problem crop up quite a bit. People just use gains arbitrarily like 70, 50, but what I want to make sure everybody understands is the default gain is usually a value of 100. That's generally where you want to be. If you go lower than 100 and you're shooting a narrow band and not taking very long exposures, there's a good chance that all of your photos will have sensor banding and all kinds of other problems baked in. And even if you dither and take a lot of photos, there's a chance that those problems will never go away fully. But if you put your gain to at least a value of 100, that tends to solve the problem. 
Interestingly though, if we scroll back up here, it says when the gain is set to a value of minus 25, you get an increased well capacity. And that kind of reminds me of the DSLRs where you can go like low gains. So this is something we might touch on in the full review, even though we're mainly focused on the guiding performance, but we'll take a look at that too. I don't really think we're ever gonna need to use that, but some of you guys might need to. If you have really fast telescopes like a Raza, for example, then potentially you'd wanna use a lower gain. But still, I'd recommend everybody just start at a gain of 100 for most CWO cameras and stick with that unless you need to adjust it for whatever reason. If you followed my channel for a while, you know amp glow drives me crazy ever since I got my Nikon D750 back in the day. And according to this, there's no amp glow. But as always, I'm gonna test that and verify it because that's one of the biggest things I look for. I realize you could fix it with darks easily enough, but it's just an annoyance for me. The final thing to note is the cooling system. And to be clear, what they're saying here is that it can get down potentially to 35 degrees Celsius below the ambient air temperature, not minus 30 degrees Celsius, that'd be crazy, but below the ambient air temperature. And we're gonna see just how well that works because it's fairly warm outside tonight. But as most of you know, you always want that sensor as cool as possible. That way you reduce the grain in your photos at night. That's one of the downsides of using a DSLR is there's no way to cool it down. And especially if you're shooting the desert in the summer, you're gonna have a lot more grain than you normally would. There's really not much more to cover here. I don't want to spend the whole video talking about camera specs, even though that's part of a review. But the final thing I'll note here is that this little screw is designed to help with focusing the auto guider sensor. And I'll show you how to do that later on when we actually get out there. I think we've covered this enough though. So let's head outside now and see how the camera performs. All right, I've got everything turned on. The cables are connected. We're ready to go. And I'm here inside the ASIR app. You can see I'm using the ZWO AM5 for my mount, still working really well. And the first thing we need to figure out is the main scope focal length. I think it's 600 millimeters, but I could always put to zero and it will figure it out for me. However, I have to put in some focal length for the guide scope. It will not take zero. So I'll put 600 because that's what it should be. Then we can set our main camera and our guide camera. Obviously the 2600 is our main camera and the guide camera is the 220 mini. It's kind of cool it has both those cameras running off one USB cable. That's all there is to it for our main settings here. We can click on enter and continue on with the workflow. Next, let's click on the main camera settings up top here and take a look. I'm gonna put my gain to a value of 100 as we discussed earlier, that should work fine. And if we try to lower the gain, it can't go to minus 25 even though it said something about that in the spec sheet. There might be something I'm overlooking here, but I thought we'd touch on that either way. Moving down to the cooler settings, we have minus 20 degrees Celsius, minus 10 or zero, but you can actually go down as low as minus 40 degrees Celsius by moving the slider. I think you could do this on a lot of the other ZWO cameras as well, although I've actually never tried. But to be clear, there's no guarantee it's actually gonna hit minus 40 degrees Celsius, especially if you're shooting in the summer. And it's also gonna draw a lot more power if you do that. So I'd recommend just setting it to minus 20 C and that works fine 99% of the time. I also have the anti-do feature turned on. And another thing you wanna check is the customized file name. I would advise turning on all these features. That just makes it much easier to stay organized on the computer. Moving down to the guide settings, I would recommend putting the gain to high if you're doing anything similar to what I'm doing because I'm shooting through a narrowband filter and an F7 aperture roughly. So I'm gonna need a very high gain here. Moving down, there's an option to turn on guide camera bin two. Without getting into all the technical details of binning, this will help in low light scenarios as it says here. And because we are in a very low light scenario, I'd recommend we turn this one on as well. With all that out of the way, let's go back to the main preview window and take either a five or 10 second long photo with our Batonov mask on the telescope. We need to make sure those stars are sharp before we go any further. And because this is actually my first time using the extender in the middle of the night, my focus was way off, as you might expect. Thankfully, I found this blurry thing up here in the upper right, which told me there's some sort of star there. And to make a long story short, I eventually got the telescope focused and I was ready to move on with the workflow. Now that my main camera and telescope are focused, we need to make sure that the auto guider sensor is also properly focused, which is kind of weird because we're used to doing it separately. But anyway, if I go to the guide camera, 
I begin looping, I can see if my guide stars look sharp. They should, but there's a chance they won't. And once the photos appear here, note that I am taking five second long exposures by the way, but the stars are definitely not sharp. This is where that little screw on the side of the camera is gonna come in handy. We're gonna have to turn that one way or the other to make the stars sharp. But we have a problem. We can't zoom in in that guide view. So let me show you a workaround. If we go back to the main preview window, go to the guide settings, we're actually gonna turn off the switch for the guide camera, go to the main camera settings and turn off the switch here as well. Then we'll select the mini or the auto guider sensor and turn that on for our main camera. This is a technique I learned using my star tracker and actually works quite well. The whole point of doing this is we can now zoom in and see the stars better because we've set the auto guider sensor as the main camera. I hope that makes sense. It's just kind of a workaround to the limitations of the ASIR really. Now that we've zoomed in, we can start to turn that little screw on the side of the camera until our auto guider sensor looks sharp. And I have to say this was not as easy as I hoped it to be. I mean, it wasn't hard per se, but it was just kind of weird at first. This is one of those things I'm sure that after two or three nights, it won't be a problem. But that first night, it was definitely a bit confusing. And after about five minutes of trial and error, I finally got both the guide sensor and the main camera sensor focused with my main telescope. And to be perfectly clear, the whole reason I went through all those extra steps is just because I wanted to zoom in closer and see the stars better. Because in the guiding interface, you do not have that ability. You only have it here when you have a main camera selected. So for whatever that's worth. You just have to remember, once your stars are sharp, go back up to the main camera settings, turn off the switch, select the 6200 Duo as your main camera, turn the switch back on, then go to your guide settings, select the 220 Mini, turn on the switch. With both cameras ready to go, the next step is to do our polar alignment. And if you haven't done so already, I recommend you remove your Batonov mask and then we'll continue on. The polar alignment steps were very straightforward. I've shown them a million times. The only difference was my exposure was set to five seconds. Normally it's three, but because I'm at like F7.4, I think, and shooting through a narrow band filter, I had to really increase the exposure as much as I could to overcome the limited amount of light. The hardest part of the night should now be over. We've done our polar alignment. We've got everything focused, at least to begin with. Now we need to figure out what we're gonna photograph. For this, we'll go back to the preview window, click on the sky atlas button in the lower left, and then find the object that we want to photograph. I need to do something pretty high up overhead because there's a lot of trees around. And I also have about 11 raccoons around me right now. They're getting closer and closer. I can see about 11 different pairs of eyes here with the red headlamp. And they're making some weird noises. Hopefully they don't come over here and pull my wires, but I think we'll be okay. And here's my current composition. I went through, I found a nice view of the North American Nebula. The trees are not in the way, so that's a good sign. And I hit go to. My AM5 got me right where I needed to be. Now that I've got my composition looking good, I need to readjust my focus. You can see the stars are blurry again. At first I thought this was due to the air temperature cooling down, but then I realized that because I'm pointed almost straight up overhead, and the camera is so heavy, it's actually pulling the entire tube down with it of the telescope and that's shifting my focus. So I have to be very careful when I'm doing anything now that I know that the focus can be shifted that easy. But this is why I always stress that you wanna check your focus whenever possible because there's no point in taking blurry data. At this point, I put my bad knob mask back on. I turn my focusing knob very slowly and then once I got my main camera focused, I went back to the guiding interface and verified that that was also in focus. And after a little trial and error, I also got the auto guider focused again because that had also gone a little bit blurry. Remember, you're gonna turn that silver screw on the side of the 2600 Duo, wait a few seconds for the preview to update. If the stars got worse, turn the screw the other way. This does take some practice, and eventually I got the hang of it. When you finally get your auto guider stars looking sharp though, we can begin the calibration process. We'll click the begin looping arrows if we need to. Then we click the begin guiding crosshair button. It will automatically choose some stars, and now it's gonna go through 
and do the calibration. This is all automated though, and rather than just sitting here watching it, I recommend we back out of the guiding interface. This takes us back to the main shooting interface, and from here, we're gonna change to auto run. This is a great time to go through and configure everything, that way you're not wasting time later. The Meridian flip is in about an hour, and it's probably gonna stop about 20 minutes before that anyway. That way it doesn't bang into my tripod. So I really only have time for at most 10 photos, which I'll put in right here. My shutter speed, I'll leave at five minutes or 300 seconds. That's kind of the sweet spot for my gear. Global gain is set to 100, so that's fine. That all looks good. And because we're trying to test the auto guider performance, I'm actually gonna take a single 10 minute long photo to start off with, and we'll see how the guiding performs. Let's head back to our graph now. It looks like our calibration is just about done. I'm gonna clear that, because usually the start is pretty wonky. And there we go. Check it out, my total error currently is 0.25 arc seconds. That's the best I've ever seen on my equipment. Granted, I'm using a little tiny ZWO guide scope normally, and now we're upwards of almost 900 millimeters equivalent focal length. So we have way more zoom, so it should be more accurate. Then again, we're shooting through a narrow band filter, and our aperture is pretty small as well as around f7.4. Let's get back to the auto run menu real quick. I've got everything configured, and I'll click on the start button to begin this sequence, that way I can at least get some data before the Meridian flip. And that's all there is to it. We've gone through the bulk of the workflow. Now we can finally sit back and see just how well this guider works in these adverse conditions. Because this is a 10 minute long photo, I'm just gonna leave this here on the graph screen. I'll probably speed it up like a thousand percent and we could see if anything major happens. I'm guessing it won't unless there's a gust of wind, but if anything does happen, we'll catch it right here. It's been about 10 minutes now, and having watched the graph there, it got close to one arc second, which still isn't bad, but that's the worst I saw, so that's pretty darn good performance. Like I said at the very start of the video, I was very skeptical that this thing would work at all, and the fact that we're getting one arc second or better in terms of guiding is very impressive. Unfortunately though, if we zoom into the 10 minute photo, we can see a bit of star trailing. It's not terrible, but it's, I wouldn't say it's usable either. And I'm not saying this is necessarily the camera or the auto guider's fault, it's more likely, I would say, the AM5's problem, where it can't really shoot 10 minutes even with an auto guider and sell sharp stars at a focal length equivalent around 900 millimeters. And that's why almost all the time I just shoot at five minutes, because even a narrow band, it's usually long enough to get enough data per photo, and you don't have to worry about star trails. And that's why for the rest of the night, I'm just gonna shoot five minute long photos, and we'll see how that goes. Morning everybody. So last night I stayed up until about 3 a.m. watching the guiding and it was pretty consistent right around one arc second for most of the night. The worst rating I saw was 1.25 arc seconds, which was fairly brief, and he would usually go back down pretty quickly. So overall, the guiding was consistent, if nothing else, and around one arc second, that's not bad. But I will say that with my just standard auto guider and guide scope, which I've got, somewhere around here. Uh, that's usually 0.8 arc seconds, it worst 0.9. So this was a little bit worse than normal, I have to say. Then again, I was shooting at a much smaller aperture than normal. I was encountering focusing issues, which we'll get to in a second, among some other problems. So I think if I do some more tests, we can identify if that was more user error or just the limits, of course, of what an auto guider can do at a small aperture through a narrowband filter. Next, I want to touch on the focusing problems that I encountered last night, because that had nothing to do with the camera. It was actually a problem with the Ascar V. Thankfully, there's already a solution out there. I did some research, and the good folks at High Point Scientific had an article on their website, and they discussed that if you got a very early model, which I'm guessing most of us reviewers got those models, they have an issue where if you have a big heavy camera, like the 2600 Duo, it can actually pull the entire focuser downwards especially if you're pointing up towards a zenith, like I was. Now, to their credit, Sharpstar has gone through and made a video that shows you how to fix it. I'm going to do that later today, 
and hopefully that works fine. But I thought I should mention this because if you do have an early model as Carv, and you notice that the focus is shifting when you're pointing really high up, this will be something you want to look into. Again, it sounds like it's just the pre-release models that reviewers like myself got, so I'm guessing most of you won't have this trouble. But that certainly contributed to a lot of the problems I had last night. If that was not a factor, I think the process would have been a lot smoother, and overall my impression of the camera would have been a bit better. But there were just so many moving parts that were getting confusing, that was something I had to work around. Now that we've established that the guiding was pretty solid around one arc second for upwards of seven hours last night, I want to go through and take a look at the actual photos and see how the final image turned out. And here is the stacked image straight out of PixInsight. This is about 36 or 37 five minute long photos taken at an aperture around f7.5, 600 millimeters on the 2600 Duo camera. And if we zoom in, there's a little bit of trailing you can still see in the photos. The focus also isn't perfect due to the issues I just talked about, but I think we can overcome both of these problems with Blur Exterminator. And overall, I think the data turned out really nice. So that's a good sign. Considering that was my first night with the gear, I ran into a lot of problems, but I still was able to make it work. I know we just did a processing tutorial, but we might as well do one more if you want to stick around and watch it, because this will tie into how well the camera performs. Again, we didn't have that much data, we didn't capture that much light, so we'll see how the final image looks. As always, I'm going to start off with spectrophotometric color calibration. And last night I used the Optolong L Enhance, which further complicated things in terms of seeing and all that. And we can drag and drop that on the photo. When it completes, we see the green dots, which are more or less along the line. I'll note that I didn't use Photon Flux for the white reference. We'll see if that really makes a difference or not. Now what we need to do is grab the screen transfer function tool and then we'll nuke the image. It's a bit red for my liking. I can always fix that later, but it's definitely a little bit too red. So if you're just not getting the results that you want from SPCC, then as you know, you can always use the screen transfer function tool instead. And for that, you just turn off the chain link button, nuke the photo. That's a little bit too blue for my liking, but it was at least worth a shot. And the nice thing is I can just redo SPCC, turn on the chain link, and that actually doesn't look too bad. So what I did is I did SPCC, but then I turned off the chain link and nuked it. And I'm editing in a bright room right now, so that's probably throwing off my color perception, but that looks pretty color neutral to me. So I'm gonna stick with that for today. Our colors are fixed, that was pretty easy. The next step, is to run Blur Exterminator. That should clean up any slight star trails I had from last night and fix any focusing problems I might have had. So I'm gonna increase the sharpen stars back to the default around 0.25, and then we'll drag and drop the triangle. Blur Exterminator is now finished. And here's our before and after. It's pretty resource intensive even on this powerful computer, which tells me that it definitely needed the Blur Exterminator. But yeah, I think that looks great. So as always, Russell Croman saves the day. And if you don't have Blur Exterminator yet, or maybe you're still trying to decide if you want to deal with PixInsight, I think this tool alone is worth the investment. So that looks great. Now what we'll do is Star Exterminator. Because my philosophy is I want those stars out of the way so I can really have complete artistic control over the nebula. Okay, there's the stars gone. And check that out, we have a real nice view now of the nebula right there. Another reason to get those stars out of the way is because we can see the grain a bit better. And there's surprisingly little grain. I figured this would look way worse considering how little data we actually captured. So that's an encouraging sign, both for the Ascar V and for the 2600 Duo camera. Even in the worst configurations in terms of light gathering, if you can get even one night's worth of data, you can get a pretty good looking photo. And even if there is a little bit of grain, we can clean that up fairly easily with Noise Exterminator, also from Russell Croman. And that looks considerably better now. I might have turned it up a bit more. I can always fix some of that grain later though. And if you're still on the fence about Pix and Sight, I know I just talked about this, but I hope you're starting to see how some of these tools are just so streamlined. 
and trying to do something similar in Photoshop or Affinity Photo, whatever you might be using, is just way more time consuming difficult and the results are nowhere near as good. I understand cost might be a concern because obviously Pixinsight is not free, the plugins are not free, but if you have the money and you're really getting into the hobby, don't make the mistake I did or I'd used Photoshop for many years exclusively. That worked fine, but it definitely hindered my image quality over the years looking back. And more importantly, this new workflow is just so much easier. Now that I'm done with my little spiel there, let's finish this up. I'm going to stretch the photos real quick, do some minor processing, and then we'll be about done for this part of the video anyway. I realize this is going to be a pretty long video, but at the same time, I want to make sure I'm as thorough as possible. So what we'll be doing is I'm going to test the camera gear again tonight, now that I've found out what the focusing problems are. And with a little bit more experience, I'm also going to shift around the Ascar V. I'm going to use something a little bit more forgiving. We're not going to be at f7.5 anymore in 600 millimeters. And we'll see if the guiding performance changes. But there we go. I stretched both photos. I'm now going to save the Nebula photo right here into a new directory called TIFF, making sure, of course, I change this to the TIFF format. And then we'll do 16 bits. That works well with Photoshop. Then we can, eh, we'll just go right to Photoshop and finish up with the editing portion of today's video. And that reminds me of all the PBS ads about, you know, viewer support and all that. But if you like the videos and you're interested in learning more, I do of course have my courses available on my website and on howtube.com. So if you want to learn more, be sure to check those out. I also have my Patreon page, which I don't really ever talk about, but we're doing one or two videos on there per month. So that's a much more inexpensive way to learn if you want to go that route. Anyway, here is our cleaned up, processed final photo out of Pixinsight. Looks pretty good, I have to say. The first thing I'm going to do, because the colors look fine, is use a curves tool with the hand icon selected. We'll make this background here a bit darker, make this a bit brighter. And this is why I like getting the stars out of the way, because now I can really have fun with the data. Whereas if those bright stars are there, they really tend to get messed up in this process. And again, I should stress that I have a bright window open in front of me. I could close it, but I like to edit my photos in different lighting conditions. I normally start off in a dark room and then edit the photo again in a bright room. Because when people are looking at your photo, there's no guarantee what lighting conditions they're going to be looking at. And they're not even going to be thinking about it, probably. So it's always a good idea to have a photo that looks good both in low light and in bright situations. That's looking pretty awesome though. So let's hit Control Shift Alt E and we don't even have to do much to this photo, which is kind of nice. I recently did, I think it's called the Question Mark Nebula. I never even heard or seen of it until a few days ago when I tried photographing it. It turned out pretty well, but the processing was much more difficult than this one here. So it's nice when we actually have things easy for a change. There is a bit of color noise though, if we really zoom in here. And this is why I really like using the camera raw filter. Because if you go into the detail tab, you can increase the color noise reduction slider. And very quickly, the color noise is fixed. This is one of the best little secrets of the camera raw filter. So here's our before. You can probably see those colored pixels now and after. Honestly, I think color noise is one of the biggest problems I see in some people's photos and they don't either don't notice it or they don't know how to fix it. So now you know a way. It's pretty easy. It works quite well. For our color grading, we can give this a shot. And you can really have an artistic flair to the image if you know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, just spin the dials around until it looks good to you. That's honestly what I do most of the time and it can be pretty fun. And this is really starting to look a lot better. We fixed those blue green shadows now we're really starting to get a nice color balance. So let's hit OK and continue on with the workflow. Let's save this now. And yeah, I'll just save it anyway. Then we'll bring it right back into Pixinsight. You can really see the difference now looking at the original here. And then we'll make this one a bit bigger. We'll grab our pixel math tool from the left. And then we'll enter our equation we learned from Adam Block, which is combine. Nebula, comma, stars, comma, OP underscore screen. Then we'll rename both of our photos right here to Nebula 
and stars. We're gonna create a new image, and then we'll click on the square. If I'm going through this way too fast for you, I understand, but I've done this recently in my Elephant's Trunk video, so I recommend you go watch that. Or again, check out my Deep Space course on my Patreon where I go through this in a lot more detail. But yeah, that looks pretty awesome, considering that's one night's worth of data, f7.5 with a narrowband filter, and using an auto guider that's built into the camera. So I think that's gonna be a winner right there. I'm pretty proud of that, considering everything we just talked about. Let's save this as another TIFF. And I think that's gonna do it for our editing portion of the video. So I hope you enjoyed that. Like I said, what my goal is gonna be is to go back out tonight and then use a different configuration. And we'll see if the guiding performance is any better. I'm guessing it will be because we won't be at such a small aperture. But yeah, here's some more of the finer details so you can see that. I haven't done any sharpening yet besides whatever Blur Exterminator did. So that's a good sign. And that's gonna do it for the post-processing section of the video. I realized I went through that very fast, so I apologize if you got lost, but it was more just to give you an idea of what I'm doing. Looking ahead, I'm gonna go through and test the auto guider again tonight with a different ASCAR setup, and we'll see if the guiding performance is better when we get more light to that sensor. Welcome back. This is now day three of testing, and last night I told you that I was going to swap the configuration to something a bit more forgiving, but then I realized I could get a really nice shot of the Crescent Nebula, which I've never actually photographed before. So I left the configuration exactly the way it was as the first night, set everything up. It was a lot easier this time now that I know what to look out for. And I was up and running in about 20 minutes. Unfortunately, there were no raccoons to hang out with, but that's okay. Now, once I got things up and ready, I began the guiding. And it was pretty much the same story as the first night. Right around one arc second, occasionally getting up to 1.3 arc seconds of total error but still pretty good. This gave me some ideas though, because I figured I should be getting better guiding than what I'm seeing. So I went into the guide settings, and rather than choosing the automatic star choices, I just tapped on a star manually that I thought would work better. And indeed, it actually cut the total error down in half, at least for a while. And that would be one recommendation I have for you. You know, the auto guiding automatic settings usually work well, but you can always fiddle with them and see if you can get better results. I also changed the exposure of the auto guider from five seconds to three seconds to get some more frequent corrections, and that seems to have also helped. Unfortunately, most of the night was wasted though, because I made a big mistake that I warned you about earlier in the video. I stayed up until about 11. The images were looking pretty good, so I said, I'm gonna go to bed. I really need to get some sleep. Then I pulled all the images off the ASIR this morning, and it looks like right when I went to bed, the focus shifted and the rest of the night was blurry. Now, of course, this has nothing to do with the camera that we're reviewing, but I thought it was a very important point because it even happened to me recording this video. You need to always keep an eye on that focus, especially if you're aimed up near the zenith like I was. That tends to put a lot of pressure on the focusing elements and they tend to shift throughout the night. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I think tonight is gonna be our last clear night for a while. And while I could use a different configuration for further testing, I really wanna get a nice shot of the Crescent Nebula. Therefore, I'm gonna stick with the extender, the ASCAR-V, and the Optilong narrowband filter. And hopefully by the end of the video, I can share that final image if I get more data and the stars actually stay sharp all night long. So that's gonna conclude my initial impressions and testing of the ASI 2600MC Duo. I don't have a final verdict quite yet. I mean, I intended this to be a full review, but I haven't had enough time. It's only been three nights, obviously. So I'm gonna save the full review I don't even know if I'm going to do an official video. It'll probably just be more like updates as the months go on. So before we go today, I want to give you my final feedback and let you know what I think of the camera. Let's start off by addressing some of the problems I thought I would encounter. The first was that threaded adapter ring, which, as Nico mentioned in his video, is just a separate little piece which could get stuck. Now, I've used it for the last three nights. I didn't have any issues with the threaded adapter ring getting stuck on the back of my telescope. I tried multiple times. It always came off without a problem. So I don't think that's gonna be as big of a concern as I thought it would be, but I still agree with Nico that ZWO should have made this one threaded adapter piece, because if nothing else, it would be very easy to lose that one screw and not be able to use your camera anymore. So hopefully ZWO listens to that feedback and they make a separate piece which you can buy on their shop for a few bucks or even just include it in the next batch of cameras because I think that'll go a long way. But again, the threaded adapter so far is not that big of a problem. Another thing to note is that the little focusing screw on the side of the 2600 Duo is a bit difficult to turn. 
But I guess that's a good thing because if it was easy to turn, you could really throw things out of focus very easily. So the way it is is not a problem. It just takes some getting used to, especially if you've had an auto guider and guide scope before. Trying to think about this now where everything's going through the main telescope is a bit strange. And that leads me to probably the most important revelation after testing this camera. If you've used a telescope over 1000 millimeters, you understand just how important it is to have good guiding because even slight imperfections will show up in your photos. And this is why most people shooting over 1000 millimeters have an off axis guider because they need really precise results. And this is where the 2600 Duo shines, I think. For those people that are shooting at high focal lengths, you can now get rid of that off axis guider and do everything through a single cable coming out of the back of the Duo. And to be clear, I've never actually used an off-axis guider, but from what I've seen, it's kind of cumbersome to get the little chip lined up properly, and then you have to worry about maybe it shadowing the main sensor. So this is really who this camera is designed for. Now, for those of us that still shoot 600 millimeters or less, I don't think that this camera is necessarily going to be the best investment. I mean, it's a good camera, but do you need that extra feature? Probably not. I still have my little 120mm mini here and the 30 millimeter f4 guide scope i've used this since like 2017 i think it's done a great job and i still don't really have any complaints with it i mean the guide scope's not the sharpest thing in the world but it works fine but if you're looking to buy your first dedicated astro camera and you don't have an auto guider and guide scope yet then this might not be a bad idea because it's going to simplify things and it's going to future proof your setup if you ever decide to get a larger telescope finally and most importantly in terms of the guide performance the camera really surpassed my expectations at the start of the video, I wasn't even sure it would see any stars whatsoever, but I was pleasantly surprised that we stuck around one arc second of error for most of the night. And I'm sure if you have a telescope that lets in more light and you're not shooting a narrowband, your guiding will probably be even better. And this is something I'll continue to cover in future videos as I continue to mess around with the camera. So I'll let you know if I encounter any problems or if things look a lot better. But that's all I've got for you today. This video has gone on long enough. I hope you learned something about the Duo if you've been thinking about buying it. And again, my recommendation currently would be if you're shooting above a thousand millimeters, you might want to seriously consider this camera that we don't have to worry about an off axis guider. But if you're shooting 600 millimeters or less, you don't need this camera. It would just be nice to simplify things and not have to worry about that additional auto guider and guide scope. So that's all I've got for you. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in another video.